Welcome to Gossip About Gossip, powered by Hedera Hashgraph. In each episode, we'll cut through the hype of blockchain promises and explore real-world examples of organizations creating the next generation of decentralized applications, which will bring trust back to the internet for us all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Gossip About Gossip, the podcast where we talk about real-world applications for distributed ledger technology. My name is Zenobia Godschalk, and I'm the SVP of communications here at Swirls Labs, helping to grow the Hedera ecosystem. Today, I am joined by Keith Cole, who is our Director of Product Management at Swirls Labs. Hi, Keith. How are you? Hi, Zenobia. It's great to be here. Thank you. Good. So we have a super fun topic to talk about today. Can you give us a little sense of what really are sold bound tokens? Yeah. So maybe just as kind of a, a way of intro, um, you know, I myself have been working in the decentralized identity space for a while um, for different companies, um, you know, working with, uh, you know, working like issuing credentials from employers to employees and things like that. I think that a lot of what we've been working on the decentralized space, I think that people would probably term to as Web 2. I mean, I think that there's always been this kind of uh, movement within the Web 3 space about, well, can we do identity with tokens? And because it certainly as NFTs grew more popular. And, you know, those ideas have been swirling around for a while. And then I think those kind of have recently come more sharply into focus. Um, I think initially Vitalik released a paper or, or a blog post about something he called soulbound tokens, which I think is a reference to a video game. Uh, and then more recently, there was like a quasi, an academic paper, a quasi-academic paper uh, written by Vitalik, and then also a, a gentleman named Glenn Weil and Pooja Olahavar. Hopefully I didn't massacre that name too much. Uh, where again, I think they brought this concept of soul, what they're calling soulbound tokens into uh, stronger focus. And you know, at the end of the day, what they're referring to are basically non-transferable, non-fungible tokens. But I think that you know the the use of the word soulbound just adds some kind of marketing pizzazz to it, which is really kind of you know piqued people's interest, and I, I think in a good way, like generated discussion. What are some examples of things that you think could be um, encapsulated in a soulbound token? Well, I think this is the this is the the million dollar question. I think the paper itself, um, you know, I think you know their focus really seems to be on like a, what they term as decentralized society. So the paper actually jumps around to a whole range of different applica- potential applications of soulbound tokens. I think that from my perspective, you know. Uh, being in this space for a while, you know, we've looked at many different types of credentials, academic credentials, you know, driver's licenses. Um, you know, you took a course, you attended a conference. You know, there's a wide range of credentials that can attest to something, some facet of your identity. I think probably what's caught the community's attention is, you know, there is this community of people that have been working on a technology stack that's based around ver- this standard called verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers or DIDs. Uh, that really have a lot of privacy preserving elements. But actually, I don't think that that's a good comparison with soulbound tokens. I think the better comparison with soulbound tokens is another standard called open badges. Open badges is a standard that's been around for a long time. Um, they're quite common. Like you take a course, you do something, somebody will issue an open badge. You could, it has typically an associated web page with it. And you can, you know, you post it on your LinkedIn profile and any of your friends can, can click on it. And I, I mean, no offense, but it's kind of like a low tech way that just kind of works and is quite popular. And I think what what's you know what makes open badges open badges is they're explicitly de- designed to be public attestations of something. So it's not something that you don't create an open badge with your driver's license or your degree. Now you create open badges for things that you you're fine to be public, like that you know I just t- I just finished this first aid course or I you know got my Azure architect uh, certification or something like that. Like something you're happy to be public, you're happy to post on your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook profile. I think of soulbound tokens in that sense and their application in that sense. These are gonna be things that, at least initially, the way that the text stands now, these will be things that you you expressly uh, are happy to be public. And I think, of course, being on DLTs, I think the other twist to it is you're happy them being public for all eternity. So I think, um, you know, some applications, I think the, 
the initial applications, I mean, if I had to take my own guess, are going to be Web3 type applications. I think that many of the applications people are looking for is uh, items related to DAOs, whether it's DAO membership or DAO, like how do I become a member of a DAO or proving I have some credentials so that I'm more likely to be accepted into a DAO or voting within a DAO. Um, I think they also have some utility around things like airdrops, uh, things like that. But I think the initial use cases for these soul bound credentials will be things specific to the Web3 space. Okay, so I want to potentially say and be able to share with the world, hey, I am a member of this DAO that potentially conveys certain rights to me, certain access um, that I can get. But what are the considerations that I should be thinking about, both from the perspective of the DAO as potentially the issuer of a soulbound token, but also from someone who then maybe has that as part of my record. Maybe the DAO has a scandal and I don't want to be part of that DAO anymore. Um, so from both those perspectives, what do you think are some of the key considerations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I think that the paper uh, is released really attacks this from a, like a very high level, like, um, you know, use cases and kind of aspirational goals. I think that something that uh, myself and my colleague, Paul Madsen here at, at the HBAR Foundation have done is really kind of look at and just take it seriously and say, well, if we were to implement this as a real product, what are the kind of features and capabilities that we would want, uh, at least in, in an initial stage? Like, I think what they refer to as like proto, a proto wall, like a like an initial version of this. Because I think, you know, of course, there'll be a roadmap for it. There would, of course, be want more features that you'd want to add to it. But if you just wanted to do this today, what would be the features you'd want? And I would kind of break them, we kind of broke them into a few different buckets. So, of course, you'd want tools around issuance. So you would want tools so that issuers or people that want to issue you a token, which is pretty fundamental to the whole thing, because, you know, self-issued or tokens I issue to myself have limited value, at least in my mind. Really, the tokens you want are tokens that are issued by others, attesting to something about yourself. So you need that tool set for people to issue tokens. I think the other key thing that you would have to have, because again, these tokens are, they are public things and they're with you, at least in, in this version of the tech, for all time. So you want some ability for the user to accept them or not accept them. Like if I'm being given something to testing about myself, I just don't want it to land in my wallet. And I'm stuck with it forever. Like I want the ability to say, I want this or I don't want this. And I think that that's a very important like piece of functionality that would have to be included. Um, you would typically, you want the ability to, for the issuer of the soulbound token to also, also revoke the token. So if they are making an attestation about you, typically as an issuer, if I'm, if I'm going to be willing to issue that thing, I also want the ability to take back that attestation at a, at a later date if I so choose. Um, I think you can also go to other features like expiration. Like many of these credentials of this type, they expire. And you know, that's you can think about like I get a Costco card, you know, and I have to renew it every year. You could think of it like I do a first aid course and I have to do a refresher every two years. Like it expires and I have to refresh. I mean, expiration is a very common thing with credentials. So that's kind of some baseline functionality you would want. And then I think you can also get into some more advanced kind of, I would say, Web3 functionality where you want functionality like discoverability so others can discover what tokens you sold on tokens you have or don't have. Um, and, you know, queryability so that, you know, a third party can just maybe query a large group of users and see like who all has this one type of token. And you can see that functionality being very useful for things like airdrops. Um, and then, you know, finally, of course, probably the trickiest one is trust. How do I trust that the 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 entity that issued the token really is the entity that you know so let's say i did a first aid course and red cross issues me a sold on token how do i know it was really red cross that issued it how do i trust that and then how do i trust that the the holder or the user really holds that token that that, that um are they at least in the probably in the web3 space that they really own that account that they're saying they do that is presenting that token yeah, I can see a lot of issues with, you know, identity and and sort of an overwhelming, um, you know, if you think about the spam problem, right, that we thought that would get better with other various forms of communication. And now, you know, we have the same thing in Telegram and all the other channels where people can just send you things um, sort of, you know, you have to you, by default, right, which I think we want to 
um, we always say, maybe let's make different mistakes, right? We have a whole, an opportunity with Web3. Let's try to make um, not the same mistakes we've made before. Um, just going back to the example, though, of the, you know, if I want to then, if I choose to accept a token and then, uh, you know, want to later on decide, hey, I don't want to be part of that group anymore, but maybe it's before my expiration date. Is that going to be possible with soul bound tokens? Yeah, I mean, I think this would come up to some features that probably need to be built in. I mean, yes, you would definitely want that ability to whatever you want, however you want, disassociate yourself with a token. So I, I think let, let you know, let's say a token was issued to me by an organization. You know, it's not that token's not relevant to me anymore, or like that. Let's say that organization had a scandal, and I just don't want to be associated with it anymore. You would definitely want the ability to like you know, remove that from your wallet. And that's not as easy as it sounds sometimes. I, I mean, sometimes getting rid of tokens, I mean, sometimes you can burn them as a user. Sometimes you can't. I, I think that that kind of varies by implementation. Um, yeah, so I think that's definitely another, would be a very much needed piece of functionality as well. And so what would you say to folks in terms of, um, you know, thinking about, okay, if I'm choosing a platform for, you um, you know, creating my soul bound tokens, or if I'm looking for some kind of verification that the soul bound token has been built in a way that starts to consider all of these aspects. Um, you know, obviously, I'm going to ask you it from the Hedera perspective, but, um, you know, why, how can a underlying DLT kind of differentiate themselves? And what criteria do you need to look for in that DLT to make sure that your soulbound token can potentially have all these features down the road. Yeah, great question. So I think, you know, let's just start with the initial thing. What is a soulbound token? As we said at the beginning, a soulbound token is a non-transferable, non-fungible token. Well, if you look at a lot of services, um, right out the right out of the gate, they don't support non-transferability. I mean, why would they? Like most most of the time, when you're minting NFTs it's typically for the express purpose of transferring them. So I think that um, now, like maybe there's fancy ways you can do it within a smart contract or something like that, but like most token services don't have that kind of functionality out of the gate. So I think that's like a barrier number one. So I think when we, again, looking at those kind of product requirements I outlined, we said, well, how would we, let, let's say we wanted to, like somebody wants to play with cell phone tokens, they want to try it out. Um, how would they do it on Hedera? And I think like the great thing about Hedera is that, you know, with our, uh, you know, launch of the Hedera token service, you know, I think, and, you know, I wasn't around at Hedera at that time, but, you know, kudos to the architects. They built in a lot of like very forward looking functionality that would actually make the creation of soul bound tokens as we outlined in those product requirements quite easy. It's something you can do today. Um, and so, you know, today, obviously, with the Hedera token service, you can obviously mint tokens. And what we're suggesting is that we have additional functionality. So when you mint a token or you, you create a token, uh, along with it, you can create something called a freeze key and a wipe key. Um, so these are keys that you create when you create a token. And then you can uh, mint a token and you can offer that token to a, a user. Like I, I mint a token and I want to offer it to, to you. Well, so we also have the ability within our system that you have to sign uh, your acceptance that you want that token. So that's actually already part of the token service today. So again, for that product requirement that you are able to, you know, either accept or decline the offer of a token. I mean, the great thing is we, we already have that in Hedera today. It just, does, just doesn't land in your account. Um, and, you know, going on from that. Uh, so then obviously an issuer can transfer a token to your account. And then with that freeze key, they can freeze that token to your account. So what have they done? They have made it non-transferable. Um, so I guess the key point here is that the Hedera token service has kind of built in non-transferable functionality that's very easy to lose. You don't, you don't have to you know, create a smart contract or something like that. It's ready to go using that freeze key functionality. Um, and then, you know, you, you know, you've received your token, you can obviously display it like a blockchain explorer, like many of them supported there today you can discover that token, um, you know, all that kind of great stuff. But let's say later down the road that I, as the issuer found out that, you know, I issued you a token, but you actually cheated on the exam to receive like you, you should not have that token we issued you. Or that, you know, maybe that token that we're not offered, like that token's expired, doesn't have the same value as it once did or something like that. So that was the other, you know, we also have that thing, that functionality called wipe. 
So I, as an issuer, can essentially remove the token from your account or in, in kind of credential terms, I can revoke it. Um, I can you know, remove your ability to use it or display it. So again, it's not that Hedera kind of built this functionality with you know, sold on tokens, you know, for sell about tokens. It's just more like we have very robust functionality that can be easily utilized to create sold bound tokens and, and manage sold bound tokens. Very cool. Well, Keith, before we wrap up, anything else that you would like to add? Um, you know, I think it's a very active debate about the role that sold bound tokens should play, in particular around uh, the privacy aspects, uh, which are, you know, very significant and, and, and need deep consideration. I think um, our premise was more not too much like to weigh in heavily on the debate that are soul bound tokens good or bad. It's more just like if you have decided as a developer or as a you know as a as an entrepreneur that you think soul bound tokens are cool and good and you want to like you know start playing with them, we more kind of attack this. Well, how would you do it? What are the kind of core features you would want? And I think the, the great news is is that Hedera has a feature set to you know, easily allow you to start immediately playing with sold on tokens. And again, the, over time, we might, maybe the concept will die, maybe the, maybe the concept will take off and, you know, people will add more functionality to it, particularly on the privacy side, which is probably what's most needed. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, we at Hedera will look at adding additional features to make that functionality even, even more robust. Yep. And between Mance and Lehman, and of course, um, the incomparable Paul Madsen, there's a lot of security and identity DNA in this company. So definitely sure. front and center in many of our decisions. Well, Keith, thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, I suspect this will be the first of many topics that we talk about. And uh, so we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Hey.